What are you living for? To what are you looking to find meaning, to find value? Do you look to a person? Are you looking to a thing? To what are you looking or pursuing in order to find happiness and to find fulfillment in your life? The truth is that all of us are searching for meaning. All of us are searching for value. All of us long for fulfillment and for satisfaction and for happiness. This morning, my intention is to show you that true fulfillment, true happiness, and true satisfaction can only be found in Christ. And we're going to see this on display in John 7, verse 37 through verse 39. John 7, 37 through 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's help in understanding this very rich passage this morning. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we can, we can sing songs about what Christ accomplished, that we can lift you up in worship for this great plan of redemption. We thank you for the cross and, and the, the beautiful change that it brings into our life. And I pray, God, this morning, as we look at this very full text and as we consider the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that you would illuminate the text, you would illuminate the passage, that you would give your message to your people. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So John 7, as we've seen, takes place during the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths. Uh, That is the reason why everyone is gathered together in Jerusalem. If you are a male living during this time, you had to go to Jerusalem. It was required. So every male in the whole country is in Jerusalem at the time. They're they're there for the week, this seven-day-long feast, to commemorate God's leading Israel through the wilderness. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths because people would build tents or booths to live in. If you were outside of Israel or outside of Jerusalem, you would get your tent, you would get your, your booth, you would bring it in, and that's where you would live. Or for the week, that's where you would stay. If you were living in Jerusalem at the time, you would go up to your roof and you would pitch a tent and you would live in a tent. And the reason why they did this every single year was to commemorate or to remember the wilderness wanderings. Wanderings. For a long time, the people of Israel were wandering around in the desert, living in tents. And they commemorated this by taking a week every year and living in a tent, much like we celebrate the 4th of July. This was kind of a highlight for them. Significant events took place during the Feast of Booths. For example, Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 8-2 was dedicated to God during the Feast of Booths. And you remember the story. Solomon's father, David, he was king. He wanted to build a permanent dwelling for God. Uh, at this point, God, God's dwelling place, the place of worship for God, was the tabernacle. It was a tent. But David wanted to build something more permanent, something more nice. And he wanted to build a temple. But God denied his request and let Solomon, his son, build the temple. Now the place where God would be worshipped, where sacrifices would be made, where God's presence could literally be seen by the high priest, it would not be in a tent, but it would be in an elaborate temple. And that temple was dedicated during the Feast of Booths. In Ezra's time, after Solomon's temple had been destroyed, it was being rebuilt by the Jews. You know the story, they come back, they rebuild it. And during the Feast of Booths, they would read the scripture. They would recover the scripture, publicly read it, and there was great revival of God's people during this time. And here in our text this morning, we see another historic event happening at the Feast of Booths. We see Jesus, who was God made flesh, the one who tabernacled among us, who pitched his tent among humanity. He is going to offer salvation. He is going to offer life. And we see really just two main points In our text this morning, point number one is verse 37, the thirst for living water. The thirst for living water. Look with me at your Bibles at verse 37. 
John writes this, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. John says that there is this, this takes place on the last day or the great day. There is a break of a couple of days between where we have been thus far in John 7 and where we are now in John uh, 7 verse 37. Uh, in John 7 14, we read that Jesus waited until the middle of the feast to make his appearance. The Feast of Booths was a seven uh, day long feast. So Jesus shows up on the scene around day three or day four. And we looked at verse 14 through 36, where, which we've been covering for the past couple of weeks, where Jesus is teaching. He's having these conversations with the Jews, with the religious leaders. A couple of days have passed, and we are now at the last day of the feast. John writes that what is about to take place, what Jesus is going to say, what he's going to teach, what he's going to proclaim, it occurs on the last day. And John says, it's not only the last day of the feast, it's the great day. And there's some debate about which day exactly this took place. While the Feast of Booths was technically only seven days, on the eighth day, the day immediately following the feast, there was a big party, big celebration, a big uh, cookout, basically, big festival. big cel- So they're celebrating for a week long, and then when the, when the feast is over, or when the Feast of Booths is over, then they have this big party. And uh, it doesn't seem to be real. It's not clear whether John is referring to the seventh day or the eighth day um, as being the last day. And it, re- it really isn't significant. Um, I, I tend to lean towards it being the eighth day, the, the party day. And the reason why I, I lean that way is because John tells us it's the last day. And then he gives us further details, the great day. You have the last day and then you have the great day. Jesus now makes another public appearance. He stands up. And like our text last week, he cries out. He shouts what he says because he wants everybody who is in the vicinity to hear his message. He again here, by doing so, demonstrates boldness. Just a few days before this, Jesus made a public appearance in Jerusalem. He taught in the temple. He engaged the people in conversation. And in response, some people believed in him. They understood that he had to be the Messiah because no one did the things that he did and no one taught the way that he did. He he would be hard to top. He would would be hard to, to, to do more than what he did. Therefore, they concluded he has to be the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, is he going to teach more authoritatively than this man? Is he going to do more signs than he's than Jesus? And the obvious answer is no. So some people embrace him. They submit to him as Lord. Some people are astonished by him. They, they don't understand him. They don't understand his teaching. And so they're, they're confused by him and they mock him. A sizable portion of the crowd, though, they're enraged at him. And, and they get so angry, they turn into this mob and they try to, they try to grab hold of him. Maybe they're going to kill him right then and there. And all the while we we were reading about these responses to Jesus, we also see that the Sanhedrin is meeting. Remember, the Sanhedrin was the highest Jewish court in Israel. They were made up of political and theological enemies, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Those were the two groups that were comprising of the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees, you remember, were the elite class in Israel. They were wealthy. They came from powerful families. They largely controlled the priesthood. The Pharisees, however, were more, more populous. They were, they were more representative of the people. They, they weren't necessarily the elite. They, they weren't necessarily wealthy like the Sadducees. They, they, were, they were very strict adherents to the law. They wanted as much as possible to follow the Old Testament. The Sadducees, they did not. The Sadducees were more liberal. They, they denied the, the resurrection. They didn't believe in it. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't even believe in a majority of the Old Testament. So here you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They hate each other. They're they're not friends. They are enemies. But with Jesus, they find a common enemy, an enemy so great that they have to unite together to get rid of him. And as we saw last time, while while the, the crowd there is devolving into this angry mob, that wants to take Jesus out, the Sanhedrin send the temple police, like the Jewish mafia, to go arrest Jesus. Jesus, of course, escapes the angry mob. 
He escapes the temple police. We aren't told how. We don't know if Jesus just ducked out of there. We don't know if he just immediately transports somewhere else. We're not told because John keeps the focus theological. He simply says that it's not yet his time. So now in our text, Jesus again makes a public appearance at this great feast. The last time he got up there and talked in front of everybody, they were trying to kill him. He ducks down. He, he stays quiet for a couple of days. And now in our text, he again stands up and shouts out his message. And look at verse 37. He says, he cries out, shouts out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. One of the significant events that took place during the Feast, feast of Booths was the water offering. I'm going to put up here a, a map of Jerusalem, and I know it's hard to see, um, but if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, there should be like a little blue pool that you can see. That's, that's the, uh, that is the pool of Siloam. And uh, what would happen during this, uh, during this ceremony that they performed every day is uh, there would be a big golden pot. And they would go to that pool, and they would fill it up with water, and there would be this procession of, of the priests and the, the temple people. And the high priest would lead the way, and they would take this, this pot, fill it with water, and they would march all the way like a big parade through the streets of Jerusalem. And if you look at the map there, the Pool of Siloam is on the bottom left-hand corner, and the temple is that, that place on the right, that big place up on the upper right-hand corner, that second-level place. And they would take this, this water in this golden pot, and they would walk through the streets of Jerusalem, up to the temple. And when they got to the gate, they would, uh, the, the people at the temple there would blow, um, blow the sofar. That's like this big, uh, this big horn. And they would, ble- they, would, they would blow it three times. And then the people would then march up to the altar. The priests would go around it. And the, there would be a big temple choir. And the temple choir would sing Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. And then, when the, when the choir got to Psalm 118, every male in Jerusalem, they're all clustered together in the temple, they would hold up a branch in their left hand, and a citrus fruit, like an orange or something, in their right hand, and they would all cry out, give thanks to the Lord. And they would do this three times. And when they had done that, the water would be offered to the Lord and then poured out. This happened every single day during the Feast of Booths. Go collect the water, Big parade through the city, uh, trumpets blowing to, as they approach the temple, singing the psalms, raising their branches and their fruit, and shouting out, give thanks to the Lord. There was rich symbolism in this joyful celebration. They weren't doing it just because they had nothing else to do or because there was no Netflix and they were bored. Like There was a reason why they did these things. Everything was highly symbolic. The the water, it symbolized God's provision during the wilderness wanderings when Israel spent a lot of time just walking around in the desert. Israel was completely dependent upon God for their survival. He had to provide for them food and water because they were in a desert wasteland. There was no food. There was no water. So God provided for them. Psalm 78, 15 through 16, he split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock, and he caused waters to flow down like rivers. There there was no water. So you remember the story. You remember the wanderings. God would tell Moses, go strike the rock. He would strike the rock, and then this water would just come out like a river. Isaiah 48, 21, they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and the water gushed out. So during the Feast of Booths, when they're having this big celebration, they're going and they're collecting the water, and they're carrying the water through the streets. Remember, the whole celebration is commemorating their time in the wilderness. They're all living in tents, because back then the people lived in tents. They're having water ushered through the streets uh, in this big grand parade, because God had to provide for them water. Everything was symbolic. And then when they got to the altar and they poured out the water, even this was symbolic. It represented the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, something that was anticipated in the Old Testament. 
Consider, for instance, Isaiah 44.3, where it's prophesied this, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Or Joel 2.28, and it shall come to pass, afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So you have the water being marched through the streets that, that symbolizes God's providing water for the people in the desert. You have the pouring out once they get to the altar, which symbolizes the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, all this is going on every day. This happens every single day during the Feast of Booths, they do this. And on the, on the, the great day, the last day, whether that's day seven or day eight, Jesus capitalizes on all of this. The, the, this, this fanfare, this ceremony, it's fresh on everyone's mind. They're, they're, for an entire week, every single day, people have watched as the water was fetched from one end of the city, paraded through the city, gone to the, to the other side, poured out like it's all in their mind presently. And Jesus stands up and he says, if anyone thirsts. He's using what's going on in the city to teach a spiritual truth. Everybody thirsts. There is not a person who lives who does not thirst. The thirst that Jesus here speaks of, of course, is not physical thirsting, but spiritual thirsting. Jesus speaks in terms that everybody can understand. Uh, we all know what it's like to be thirsty. There is that, that longing, that craving. Uh, we, we live in the desert. We, we get this. Uh, your mouth gets dry. You feel parched. Maybe when you thirst, you, you might even get lightheaded or just feel physically ill. We've all been out in the heat of day, hiking, working, whatever, and you're sweating, you're exhausted, you're like your tongue is like sticking to you, the roof of your mouth, and you're just thinking about water. You just want cold water. You think about it, you long for it, you pursue it. You want to be fulfilled. You need to be satisfied. And then finally, we get the water and it's cold. And sometimes, if we're longing for it enough, the water can even taste sweet in our mouth. That's what Jesus is portraying here. The people every day, they've witnessed the water ceremony. The water ceremony pictured God's provision. It portrayed for them the Holy Spirit. With this fresh on their mind, Jesus stands up before all of them and shouts out, if anyone thirsts. The reality is that everyone thirsts. We thirst physically, but we also thirst spiritually. All of us are chasing something. All of us are looking for fulfillment. Every single one of us. If you, this was Solomon's struggle. Even though Solomon knew the truth, he knew the scriptures, his father had walked with God, Solomon knew that fulfillment could only be found in God, but he pursued everything that the world offers anyway. Having unlimited power, being as he was a king, having unlimited wealth, he pursued the world with all of his might. And we can actually, he tells us what it was like. If you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. If you're using a seat Bible, that's going to be page 518. I want you to see this because Solomon actually describes for us his pursuit. His pursuit of everything that this world has to offer. Look at verse 11, or verse 1 of chapter 2. Solomon says this, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure and enjoy yourself. But behold, this was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my whole heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do during the few days of their life. I made great works, he says. He says, I made, I, I made great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves 
and slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold, treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great, and I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity in striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Solomon here is a king. As much money as he he wants, he has. As much power as he wants, he has. And look what he says. He says, I turn to wine. I turn to alcohol to find pleasure, to find fulfillment. Guess where it left me? Empty. Empty. He says, I I made big works. I I built things. I built houses. I built vineyards. I built parks. I, I built aqueducts to water my forests. Empty. I bought female slaves, male slaves, female slaves. I had more than more, more goats and cattle than anyone else ever in Jerusalem. Empty. I had silver and gold money. He, he had all the money in the world. Empty. Look what he says. He had singers. He had entertainment. Men and women. Emptiness. Vanity. He says he had concubines. Many concubines. You know your your Bible, you know Solomon was given to sexual vice. Hundreds of women to have sex with every day, multiple times a day. Where did it leave him? Empty. Left him empty. He says, my expending in all of this, that was all I had in doing it. That's it. I did all of this and I was left empty-handed. It's like trying to grab wind. I'm pursuing something that's just outside of my grasp. Then look, he continues in verse 12. So I, consi- so I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw, so he says, he says I- I've lived this hedonistic life. It left me empty. So, so maybe I need to become a philosopher. Maybe I need to just, just become an, uh, an intellectual and think. Look what he says in verse 13. I saw there's more to gain in wisdom than in folly. There's more to gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet, Solomon says, I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So Solomon says, I live, I live the life of a hedonist. Any sexual desire I want, I gave myself to. All the alcohol I wanted, I gave myself to. All of the great works I wanted to build, I did. I was left empty. Left me completely empty, chasing after the wind. So I'm going to be wise. And I'm going to be a wise guy. I'm going to be a philosopher. I'm going to be a smart guy. Where does that leave me? Nowhere. Why? Because you can be a fool or you can be the smartest man in the world. At the end of the day, both of you are going to die. So why be wise if you're just going to end up dead anyway? Verse 17. So I hated life because everything that is done under the sun was grievous to me. Existence became painful because Solomon could not find fulfillment. All is vanity, he says, and striving after the wind. He continues in verse 18. I hated all of my toil in which I toil under the sun. He hated his work. Some of you can resonate. Seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or be a fool. Yet he will be master for all that I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. Solomon says, I can build my kingdom up. I can have all of these possessions, this big kingdom, and when I am dead, I don't know if my son's going to be smart or if he's going to be an idiot. 
I could spend my life doing all of this and it can be lost. And that's exactly when you read the Bible, what happens. The kingdom splits, devolves into civil war, and everything's lost. Everything. So Solomon, after, after you read Ecclesiastes, and it's a very dark book, very dark book, Solomon concludes all of it is cavel. It's, it's all vanity. It's all absurd. It's empty. It's like chasing after the wind. You're, you're, you're trying to get something that's just beyond your grasp. And in his old age, after pursuing literally everything that life has to offer, remember, he's a king, has all the money in the world. He can do what he wants with, he want, with what he wants, anything he wants to do, he, and he does it. He does it all, and he is left empty. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he writes this. It's how he ends the book. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Solomon's now an old man, and he says, I, I, I did everything that the world has to offer Here's what I conclude is the purpose of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Solomon lived his whole life pursuing pleasure apart from God and was left empty. And in his old age, he finally concluded the only way to find fulfillment in life, the only way to find happiness is God's way, God's commandments. St. Augustine would say it this way. St. Augustine would say, you, he's talking to God here, he says, you made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. You made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. That's what's going on here in John 7. So let's turn back to John 7. This is what is going on. This is what Jesus is describing here. If any of you are thirsty, everyone is thirsty. Everyone is looking for that fulfillment. And Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. This is the second metaphor that Jesus has given. In chapter 6, in the Bread of Life discourse, he says, I am the bread of life. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Of course, he was speaking a metaphor. He wasn't literally teaching that you consume his flesh and blood, nor was he talking about the Eucharist. Not at all what he's talking about. Jesus calls himself the bread of life, and he says that the only way to be with him forever is to eat him, to receive him fully, to drink his blood is to trust in his sacrifice on the cross. And now again, Jesus is speaking metaphorically. He says that if we are thirsty, and all of us are, all of us are thirsty, that we should come to him to find our drink. Jesus is here stating that he alone is our fulfillment. All of us are longing. All of us are thirsting. All of us are looking for that something that will bring us fulfillment, that will bring us joy, that will bring us satisfaction. And Jesus here declares, that's me. I am that something. I am that water that you are thirsting for. God offers himself as our fulfillment. Consider Psalm 42.1. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. Or the text that Tim read this morning, Isaiah 55, listen to it. Come everyone, this is God speaking. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. God says, why are you expending all of this time, all of this effort, all of this money, all of this energy on things in this life that are going to leave you empty? Why are you doing this? Why? I I offer you fulfillment. Come to me and I don't charge you for it. Come to me. Life in Christ is fulfilling. It is in fact the only fulfilling life that can be lived. Jesus says, you're thirsty. You're living to find fulfillment. I'm here. 
Come to me. I am the answer. You were made to be in relationship with me. And all of us know this is true. If we're, if we're honest with ourselves, all of us will admit we are all living for our own pleasure. All of, that's why we do what we do. That's why we do everything that we do for our own happiness. We are pursuing our happiness at all costs. Whatever, whatever that takes, that's what we do. And we are literally entertaining ourselves to fill this void in our heart that we all know is there. That's thirsting. You're thirsty, all of you. Christ says, I alone am your drink. When we become Christians, it's more than just repenting from our sin and trusting in Christ. It isn't less than that, but it's so much more. Becoming a follower of Christ means submitting to his lordship. It means dying to yourself, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. To become a Christian means you become a new person, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When you become a Christian, you have, you're a new person. You have a new heart. You have new desires, renewed affections. If you're truly saved, your heart's going to be like the psalmist in Psalm 73.25. Whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth I desire besides you. Or Psalm 119.10, With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Unbelievers, they could care less about God. They aren't pursuing him. They aren't chasing him. They don't love him. Those texts that I just read, that describes the heart of believers. It's the heart of a Christian to look at God and say, whom do I have but you? It's the heart of a Christian to state that there's none that he desires but God. It's the heart of a Christian to seek God and to plead with God, God, let me not wander from your commandments. Help me to be obedient to you. And through it, we are supremely happy. Not, not this stoicism that defines so many Christians. When you are living your life in Christ, you aren't missing out on anything that the world offers. Absolutely nothing. Non-believers live for the advancement of self. Non-believers live for the paycheck. They work hard to build their empire, to pursue money, to get things. They pursue pleasure, sex, drugs, alcohol, and they are left completely unfulfilled, left wanting more. It doesn't satisfy. It's like Solomon says. It's empty. It's chasing after the wind. You can have all of the alcohol, all of the sex, all of the drugs, all of the relationships in the world that you could possibly want. And at the end of it, you will be left empty. So often, so, so many people are looking to other people to find their value to find their, their meaning in life. This person makes me happy. This person gives me value. Not true. God is our fulfillment. Becoming a Christian is becoming the human being you were made for. You were made to be in a relationship with God. And like, like Augustine says, your heart will be restless until you find your rest in Christ. Psalm 73, 26, my, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 84, 2, my soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. John Piper puts it this way. He says, so be done forever with the sad notion that saving faith, that believing in Jesus is a mere decision to believe facts. No, it is coming to him as a feast, a treasure, a banquet, a spring in the desert when we are dying of thirst. Believing is receiving him as water, food, and life for the soul. We can all understand the truth of what Jesus is saying here. We all live this every day. If you're honest with yourselves, we're all thirsting. We're looking for that nourishment. How exactly do we find this fulfillment? How do we find this living water? Verse 38 through 39 tell us it's with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit 
and living water, the Holy Spirit. Verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus says whoever believes in him uh, is going to experience within them living water. To believe in Jesus means more than just intellectual agreement. To believe in Jesus, as we've seen again and again in John's gospel, does not mean that you, that you believe that you're a sinner. It does not mean that you believe the facts that Jesus is God, that Jesus died on the cross for you, for your sins. You can believe that, and there are thousands of people who do, who are still going to spend eternity in hell. Belief does nothing for anyone. You can have right theology and still not go to heaven. James 2, the demons believe. Demons aren't going to heaven. It's, it, to, to believe in Jesus is not just to give intellectual agreement or just say, yeah, you know, Jesus is God. Yeah, he died on my place. That's not it. To believe in Jesus means that you repent of your sin and submit to the Lordship of Christ. And Jesus himself says this in Mark 115. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. To repent means you change your mind about something. You say, yes, God, this is sin. You're right. I'm deserving of condemnation. I, I'm, I'm sorry for this. I'm turning from it. God, please forgive me. My sin is turning from your sin and turning to Christ. Jesus says, whoever does that, whoever truly believes, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. We need to make a few observations about this phrase because this can be confusing. First, Jesus here is alluding to Scripture. Look what it says. As the Scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus, this does, this does not seem to be an exact quotation of one specific passage in the Old Testament. So it's not like you can Google search that phrase and you're going to find one passage in the Old Testament that Jesus is quoting. It's not that. Jesus is kind of summarizing several passages in the Old Testament, like Proverbs 11.25. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. Or a familiar text that we've already seen in Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So the first observation about this confusing phrase is that this has always been God's plan. This was anticipated in the Old Testament. There's going to come a time when you are going to, from your own heart, have rivers of living water flowing from you. That's observation number one. Observation number two. Out of the heart of believers will flow rivers of living water. What this means is that when you are a Christian, you will find fulfillment. You won't have to look externally to you to find this. You're not going to have to look to people, to things. No, no, no. The living water will be present in you and flowing from your own heart. Observation number three. The living water that is present within us flows out from us. Israel, as you know, wandered in the wilderness and God provided for them a drink. And as we've already seen, the water flowed out from the rock, like a river, and it gave water to all of the people out in the desert who needed it. And so it is for you and I. We have this water flowing out from us for the sake of others. Well, we're not supposed to keep this water for ourselves. We're to, we're to be sharing it. It's our responsibility to share the gospel with other people. Christianity was never meant to be what it is so often in our day. You hang out with your closest friends, they're Christians. You, you, you never rub shoulders with non safe people. Uh, I mean, you have to put up with them at work, but meaningful relationships, we don't have them. It was never supposed to be this, this situation where you just come to Sunday morning and you get fed your preaching center and that's it. That, that was never meant to be it. Christianity was never meant to be isolationists. Of course, our closest and our deepest relationships should be believers. I mean, we're, we're called the body of Christ. We're called, the, these are our family, our brothers, our sisters. 
Of course we're supposed to meet for the, 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 the worship service where we worship together and we hear the preaching of the word. But it's more than that. We are supposed to be living on mission, sharing the gospel with other people. We're supposed to be offering this living water to the world around us, to other people. So three observations about this peculiar phrase. First, living water within us has always been God's plan. Second, living water comes from the heart of the believer. We, we won't have to pursue our fulfillment outside in external things. Third, living water should flow out of us to others in gospel sharing. How exactly does this happen? Like, how can we say that from our hearts come living water? How, how do we experience this within us? How do we experience this satisfaction and this fulfillment so much so that we can share it with others? The answer is found for us in verse 39. Look at verse 39. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So thankfully, John tells us, this is like a little, a little note, a little explanatory note, John tells us what Jesus is talking about. Jesus isn't saying that man on his own is capable of this. He's, he isn't. John clarifies that the living water that is present within us, that we find our fulfillment in, that flows out to others, this is the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. When we become Christians, the Holy Spirit literally resides within us. John 14, 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Romans 8, 11. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 6.19 Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Because the Holy Spirit is living within us, Jesus can state that from our hearts will flow rivers of living water. Because the Holy Spirit is living within us, he's changing us. He's conforming us to the image of Christ. Therefore, we then can share this hope with the unsaved. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes all of this possible. Before we draw our time to a close this morning, I need to clarify one thing in this text that may be confusing you. Look again at verse 39. Jesus says, or John writes, Now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were yet to receive. For as yet, the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet glorified. John tells us that Jesus is speaking about the Spirit, and we can all comprehend that pretty easily. But notice the potential confusion here. Jesus says that his, the people here were to receive the Spirit because the Spirit, the Spirit had not yet been given. Uh, when we get to the farewell discourse later on in John's Gospel, we're going to unpack these truths a lot more thoroughly. Uh, so we're not going to go into too much detail here. Uh, because we're going to go into a lot of detail later, like literally chapters we'll, we'll spend on this. But for right now, I just need to point out to you what this verse does not mean. This verse does not mean that before Jesus is glorified, the Holy Spirit didn't exist. Being God, the Holy Spirit has always existed. The Holy Spirit's eternal. Hebrews 9.14 How much more will the blood of Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God. So we see there that the, the Holy Spirit's eternal. He's always existed. So this verse is not saying that Jesus is glorified and then the Holy Spirit comes into existence. That's not it at all. He's always existed. What this verse is saying is that when Jesus is glorified, when he, he returns to, he to heaven, the Holy Spirit will then come and he will permanently indwell believers. Because at this time in the, Old, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit appeared and indwelled people for special purposes. He, he empowered, for instance, people for service. He, he enabled prophets to preach. He enabled 
judges to, to do warfare, uh, for kings to rule, for craftsmen to create. In the Old Testament, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was selective. Not every believer had the Holy Spirit, and it was temporary. He came for a particular task. This is why we read in 1 Samuel 6, 14, 16, 14, that the Holy Spirit departs from Saul. 1 Samuel 16, 14, now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit came and tormented him. David, who would have seen this happen to Saul, he begs God, following his sin with Bathsheba, not to take away the Holy Spirit. Psalm 51, 11, cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Under the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit's indwelling was selective, and it was temporary. And this is the reason why, as you read the Old Testament, there's this anticipation. There's this anticipation of the time that will come when the Holy Spirit will be on all believers. He will be poured out on everyone. This is why in Joel 2, 28 through 29, it says this, and and this, by the way, is quoted in the book of Acts, in Acts 2 at Pentecost. Joel 2, 28 through 29, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. The Old Testament says there's a day coming when the Holy Spirit will indwell all believers, not just kings, not just judges, not just craftsmen, but every believer, male, female, rich, poor, slave, free, old, young, every believer will have the Holy Spirit That day will come, and we see that day come in Acts 2 at Pentecost when the church is born and believers from then on out are permanently filled with the Holy Spirit. And right now it's the Feast of Booths. The Jewish people are literally enacting that. They're portraying it every day in the water ceremony where they parade this water through the city and pour it out. They're pouring it out reflective of the day when the Holy Spirit will be poured out. Jesus stands up and shouts to the crowd, if they're thirsty, they should come to him and he will give them fulfillment. He will give them joy. He will, if they believe in him, they will receive the Holy Spirit. The the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will come upon them. As we come to a close this morning, I want to again return to St. Augustine. We heard from him earlier with, the, with this quote, you've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Augustine was one of the most influential philosophers, theologians, and church fathers. Both Catholics and Protestants claim Augustine as their own. Uh, if you were to go to a Catholic church, they would, they would think very highly of Augustine. Here at Higher Ground, we're Protestant. We think very highly of Augustine. Uh, he was an incredible philosopher. If you, if you go study any philosophy course anywhere, state, secular college, you're going to learn Augustine. You're going to read Augustine. Augustine advocated the just war theory, which we all still use. As a theologian, as a philosopher, he advocated the just war theory. And as a theologian, he powerfully defended the gospel against the heretic Pelagius. You and I owe far more to Augustine than we can possibly realize. When we speak of him, We often talk about his contributions to modern thought or his development of Christian theology. But Augustine was more than a powerful figure in church history. He was a person who lived real life, who had real struggles and real battles. Before his conversion to Christianity, Augustine lived a life of rampant hedonism. His vice was sexual sin. He lived in Carthage, he sought out a concubine, and he lived with her unmarried for 15 years. You know, a concubine's job is just to have sex with men. That's her job. That's who Augustine lived with. He was devoted to sexual sin. He writes this, Augustine says, I went to Carthage where I found myself in the midst of a hissing cauldron of lust. My real need was for you, O God, who are the food of my soul. I was not aware of this hunger. Augustine knew something was missing in his life. He was hungering, thirsting for something. 
And to fill that emptiness, he gave himself over to rampant sexuality and was left empty. Augustine lived for lust. He lived for physical fulfillment through sexual pleasure. He was craving fulfillment that only God could offer. He just didn't know it yet. Then finally, the day would come. Augustine's mother, Monica, was a believer. And for years, Monica had prayed that her son would come to faith in Christ. Monica's heart was broken that Augustine lived every single day with a concubine, that he lived his days pursuing rampant sex with, with as many people as he could in Carthage. And finally, the day came where Monica's prayers had been answered. After reading Romans 13, 13 through 14, Augustine was born again. And Augustine would then describe the superior pleasure and fulfillment that he found in Christ. What he found in his relationship with Christ was far more sweeter and pleasurable than a life of sin. Augustine would write this. He says, How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. Augustine had lived for sex. He was afraid to lose it. He thought in that he could find fulfillment. But look what he says. Talking to God here, he says, You drove them from me, you who are the true, the sovereign joy. You drove them from me and took their place, you who are sweeter than all pleasure. Though not to flesh and blood, you outshine all light, yet are hidden deeper than any secret in our hearts. You who surpass all honor, though not in the, man, the eyes of men who see honor themselves, O Lord, my God, my light, my wealth, and my salvation. Christian, the Holy Spirit lives within you. He is the fountain of living water. Are you looking to him for fulfillment? Or are you chasing the fleeting pleasures that this world has to offer? Relationships, alcohol, drugs, sex, status, money, work. You can pursue that all day long and you will be left empty. You can only find real satisfaction, real fulfillment, and real joy in Christ. Everyone in this room this morning is thirsty. Jesus would have us quench our thirst in him. Let's pray. Father, we've seen a truly remarkable passage this morning in your word. We, we have seen that we cannot live this life in pursuit of happiness outside of you. C.S. Lewis says, you cannot give us happiness apart from yourself because there is no such thing. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, God, we know that this is true. There is no happiness apart from you. It's fleeting. It's temporary. It's like chasing after the wind. It leaves us thirsty. So God, I pray if there's anyone in here this morning who is not truly saved, that you would convict their heart now, that you would show them that they need to repent of their sin and trust in you alone. And God, for your people here, I ask that you would show us that our only fulfillment and joy is found in you, that we would be a people who look to you for pleasure, fulfillment, for satisfaction, and for joy. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.